This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 10th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 620 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, You also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the potential consequences for fiscal reform of Representative Gary Knopp's departure from the House Republicans. Second, Governor Dunleavy's administrative order consolidating the budget making process in the governor's office. And third, a recent op-ed highlights one of the reasons why we consistently focus on and oppose fiscal approaches which have the effect of kicking costs created by one generation down the road to those that come after. And now, let's join Michael. It's time now for our weekly our weekly uh, uh, top three with uh, our friend Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, who comes in every week. Uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is an organization dedicated to bring Alaska back on track. I mean, we've been living beyond our means for so long that we don't even kind of know what, uh, you know, kind of fiscal conservancy looks like anymore. Uh, Brad is here to try and remind us of that fact. And we're going to talk about his weekly top three uh, right now, in fact. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How are you doing? You know, I can't complain except for, uh, you know, apparently I needed just a little bit more coffee as my brain was not quite, you know, I felt like one of those operators with a big switchboard, you know, where you're plugging the thing. And I plugged the one cord into the wrong uh, into the wrong port there and was, you know, <laughs> your brain is running down one track and you're like, wait a second, that's... That's not right. I, well, everything I just said, strike it, reverse it, let's start again. That was kind of where it was this morning. <laughs> nothing like live radio, right? Yeah, nothing like live radio to make you feel humble about uh, sometimes you can insert your foot into your mouth. Uh, but let's kick things off with the weekly top three. And I was just touching on it. The number one thing on the weekly top three is the uh, attempt by Representative Knopp to create his own new bipartisan coalition rather than going with the uh rather than going over to the uh um uh, the, the republican majority what's your thoughts on what happens here and what are some of the behind the, the scenes stuff on this well this is a this is a big story that i think is going to have a lot of consequences uh up to this point the house organization seemed pretty well set we were waiting on the outcome the final outcome of the Fairbanks House race, that uh, the tight house race that Mark LeBon and Catherine Dodge have been engaged in, um, and once that was over, there was going to be a uh, looked like there was going to be a strong house or a house majority, not not a huge one, a 21 vote house majority, but nonetheless a house majority that had organized and made uh, some significant steps. One of which was to identify uh, Tammy Wilson as the co-chair of house finance uh, for the operating budget a key position can't i can't overstate how key that position is right um and solidified her in that position now uh with Knopp's uh, uh uh change uh it's uh thrown that up in the air and i'm not sure where we land um uh, i've talked we've talked a lot on the show about about how important it is to have uh, a fiscal conservative in the role as, of co-chair as, of House Finance um, and what that could mean and what that means rolling forward. Uh, the operating budget begins in the House. It's con- it's largely controlled by the House, um, and it's uh, it's a key position. And now that sort of throws that up in the air. So I, I it's a it's a huge story, and Knopp's motives um, are also uh, a huge story. 
uh, at some points he's tried to play this off as as I'm doing this because David Eastman, we can't, we, none of us can get along with David Eastman, and I'm getting out of the, uh, I'm getting out of the coalition because, uh, because you know David Eastman's going to blow it up at some point, right? In any event, and really tried to make this a personal thing, but in an interview, I think an enlightening interview, uh, yesterday with Andrew Kitcheman of uh, of KTOO, the public media outlet in uh, Juneau. Uh, I think we get down to sort of the core of what's going on here. Here are three key paragraphs uh, from from Andrew Kitcheman's piece. Knopp said a bipartisan coalition would act as a counterweight. Now, now, keep in mind that what Knopp's proposing is a bipartisan coalition. Knopp said a bipartisan coalition would act as a counterweight to Governor Mike Dunleavy while an all-Republican caucus wouldn't. Quote, you're going to have that block of legislators who are going to support the governor's agenda and a bunch of us who are not, close quote, Knopp said, quote, and it will divide our caucus even more. And so we have that diversity in the House amongst members, parties around the state, close quote. While Knopp said he agrees with some of Dunleavy's agenda, he disagrees with him on other issues like whether to enshrine permanent fund dividends in the state constitution. So what's really going on here, you know, set the whole David Eastman thing aside. That's just that's just cover. Smoke what's screen. really going on here is is Knopp is troubled that the Republicans are going to support the Republican governor's agenda. So he's blowing up the caucus uh, in a way that will, in his words, uh, act as a counterweight uh, to, to Dunleavy's agenda. Which, again, is very troubling considering uh, what you and I were just talking about during the break. Not only not supporting the enshrinement of the PFD in the Constitution, but also disagreeing with some of the simpler uh, changes to the Charter of Changes, including the Binding Caucus and the uh, Conflict of Interest Rules, etc. This really is starting to smack more. I mean, is this Seton 2.0? Is that what this ends up becoming? Uh, I mean, again, in one of the reddest districts on the peninsula, this really raises some questions about why, you know, why he would do this and why he's come out with this position. At, you know, as of now, there was a mention in must read that he asks for specific things for his um, commitment to the caucus. And all she says in her piece is they, they he didn't get them. And so that's why he did this. But we don't know what his asks were. I haven't been able to find out as of yet what his asks were. Uh, have you heard exactly what he was looking for when he was asked to commit to the caucus? No, but when you read the KTOO uh, piece in Kitcheman's uh, interview with him, uh, it becomes clear that that part of the part of the troubling things or part of the things he found troubling about the caucus was that they were forming to support Governor Dunleavy's agenda. So I no, I don't know what the specific specific asks were, but 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 his 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 point in the KTOO interview is uh, is that he doesn't want to be part of a, of a caucus that that uh, supports uh, all of Governor Dunleavy's agenda. He wants to pick pick and choose among it. And he wants to uh, he wants to have a coalition that acts as a counterweight uh, can 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 block uh, the Dunleavy agenda that from a fiscal standpoint, it, it's even more. I mean, it gets more and more troubling the more you think about this. The last time we had a bipartisan coalition was in the Senate. Uh, in, from 2008 to 2012, and that set, that bipartisan Senate coalition uh, had the largest uh, budget uh, in in the in Alaska's history. Basically, the way they kept that coalition together was they just they just spent more and more and more. If anybody wanted anything, if anybody was going off the rails in that coalition, they just gave them more money. Right, um, and and that set the stage. By building up programs, building up expectations, building up all sorts of of uh, constituencies for spending uh, that formed during that during that period, uh, that set the stage for the fiscal situation uh, we're in now. So, if you think through where Knopp wants to take us with this bipartisan 12-12 uh, Republican Democrat budget. Uh, that agrees not to take up controversial things and agrees to make everybody in the in the coalition happy. That starts sending us down the road of making of not making our fiscal situation better, uh, as 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 Tammy Wilson and the 
and the and the and the former uh, uh, House Majority Coalition uh, promised, but to make things worse uh, by sending us off into into another set spending spree. So it's um it, it's a hugely disappointing, uh, hugely troubling uh, step by Representative Knopp to 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 step out here. And once you read the KTOO interview. Uh, you get even more troubled because it sort of reveals the the the, the true the, the true goal of uh, of what he's after here. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, as they say. Uh, when it's all said and done, looks like this got drawn back. During the break, we'll uh, talk about the importance of why it's important to have people like Tammy Wilson in finance. We'll get some details on that. Uh, Brad, just for. Uh, my own gratification and for those out there who may have missed our previous discussions on this, going back to item number one and cannot breaking the majority, uh, this does throw a real wrench into the monkey works here because, uh, you know, Tammy Wilson was on track to being part of legislative finance. And uh, and that's that's a that's a real that's a big thing. It, it is. Uh, so now. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what the House majority is going to have to do, or the Republicans are going to have to do, is they're going to have to go out and find uh, some people who have been on the other side of the aisle uh, to join the coalition to buck up the coalition. And I don't know that that's going to be. I mean, I don't know if that's going to be that hugely difficult. Up until the last legislature, the Bush Democrats um, basically went with whichever caucus was uh, was going to be. Uh, going to be in power. I guess they did that in the last legislature with Bryce as a uh, speaker, but there have been times in the past, a lot of times in the past, when the Bush Democrats have come over and joined the Republicans to form a majority caucus. So there's there's a history of, of being able to do that. Uh, but I but what it does is it makes the caucus to, ki- to get those members in, uh, you have to make uh, uh, commitments and agreements that uh, that makes that caucus more moderate, um, and certainly when when additional members come in, they're going to want positions uh, themselves that will sort of potentially reshuffle uh, the structure that the uh, that the House majority uh, uh, went in with. Now, I, I'm not I don't know how that ends out. I don't know if if Tammy uh, 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 gets displaced as as House operating. A, a, a finance operating co-chair, I sure as hell hope not. Uh, but even if the, even if she holds on to that position, you end up with a a more moderate caucus. Um, and and while she may continue driving the bus uh, of of making significant cuts in the operating budget, uh, you got to worry now about uh, a more moderate caucus. Whether the more moderate caucus will uh, uh, will get behind everything uh, she proposes. So there's there's a concern about what this does to the caucus, as I said on during the airtime, um, the history you look to is the Senate. I mean, the last bipartisan majority we had was in the Senate, and they just ran amok right. uh, in terms of, in terms of spending. Right. Um, so you got you got to be concerned about that. What 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 Knopp, when Knopp was it when Knopp was a Republican uh, and and stayed in the majority, you had a, a you had a tight in the sense that it was only 21, but you had a fairly, you know, solid Republican majority that looked like it was aligned with Governor Dunleavy. Now with Knopp stepping out, particularly with the reasonings he's giving in the in the interview with Andrew Kitcheman, um, you've got you, you you've got something that that gets closer to chaos than than structured order uh, in the House. And you know, it's like you gave him a 52 pickup. You don't know you don't know where it's going to end now. Right. Um, but but in any event, it, the, the forces at work are to make that House majority or whatever majority emerges much more moderate on fiscal issues than I think uh, than I think where we were headed before. Which, again, plays back into this article with Kitcherman, which basically says that's I think that's one of the things that Knopp is not excited about. I don't think Knopp, based on my reading of this, is really interested in cutting back on the size and scope of government, which is a little disappointing. Um, and I agree with what Harold said over here, uh, and this has always been kind of my thought, is that, you know, Congress, legislature, state houses, they're not supposed to get along. I mean, they are supposed to be, uh, you know, kind of adversarial because that's how you whittle things away. If everybody kumbayas, that's the road to bulking up and making government larger because everybody gets along and they're like, oh, yeah, you could spend that. 
Whereas if they're a little bit at each other's throats, there's always a little bit of cutting and gnashing and whittling away going on uh, back and forth. And I think that that I think that makes for a better legislature overall. Yeah, it's um, well, I, I the, the, the back and forth is is good. Sometimes it gets carried away. I, what was really important to me or what, what has been important to me about this legislature is we get we get a, a, a structure that is focused on uh, cutting spending. If you have the governor's office focused on cutting spending, if you have uh, the Senate majority saying they're going to back the governor, uh, we've yet to really see that play out. But if you have them saying that, uh, you need a, and you have a House majority saying that, then we're going to get something done. But if you've got a legislature that is going to, you know, not work uh, with the governor's office, work fully with the governor's office to get it down, uh, we're not going to we're not going to achieve the same level of, of, of fiscal sanity, spending reductions that uh, that we were uh, that we would under the under the structure we thought we had. So it's a big deal. I mean, it's just one guy. Uh, one representative doing this, but given how tight uh, things were in the House on numbers, um, it's a it's a big deal, and and it's a deal that I think we're going to uh, 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 be talking about through the remainder of this legislature, uh, or through the remainder of this session, and possibly through the remainder of this legislature as it lasts two years. We're continuing now with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets here on the program. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, continue to deal, delve down into his weekly top three. Although I will say that during the break, we were talking about a couple things, and uh, I caught uh, just a, out of the corner of my eye, I caught this paragraph out of the article from KTOO going back to the number one thing with the Gary Knopp thing, which I thought was very much a, uh, I don't know if this is Peter Bajicki 2.0 or what, uh, Knopp said, there are other legislatures on my side of the aisle who acknowledge and know that the coalition should happen, needs to happen, but won't step forward because of fear of retribution from the party and constituents. And it's a genuine fear. And I guess I have a different position. I'm not worried about the next election, which is very reminiscent of what uh, Senator Machicki <laughs> said right before he voted to cut the PFD. Um, and so, I, I mean, I don't know what you, you want to weigh in on that before we jump into the third of the top three. Well, uh, Representative Knopp was one of those who did not have um, did not have opposition either in the uh, primary or in the general election, um, and and looked like he was going to just glide on in, sort of like uh, Peter Machecki at one point, and uh, and and then Ron Gillum stepped up and ran against Machecki in the primary, and and I think did a wonderful job uh, identifying. The, the problems with Machecki's positions and 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 supporting an agenda, uh, this Gillum supporting an agenda that was consistent with uh, with Governor Dunleavy's and 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 it came very close to defeating Machecki in the primary and then ran a very strong race uh, as a write-in in the general campaign. I think I think Gary has just Representative Knopp has just assured himself he will he will have primary opposition uh, next time out. Um, if not a general uh, general election proposition, and it, it's it, it is the Machecki disease. It is you know the disease of I think Machecki at one time said he was a profiling courage for you know supporting PFD cuts, backing the governor, um, uh, calling the governor courageous and, and backing PFD cuts. It, it's it's that it's that you know it's that it's that problem we have have that we elect people think they're going that and elect them and think they're going to do one thing uh, and then they go down to Juno or they become affected by Juno disease uh, and they do something entirely different they think that they know better right uh, than, than the constituents that elected them so it's um it, it is it is reminiscent of uh, of Machecki. we've got a lot to cover here today so let's talk about your number two of your weekly top three and that is the first administrative order uh, that was put forward by the governor was a consolidation of how the budget is factored and financed, bringing all the different um, budget departments, all the different you know budget factions amongst all these different departments, which were normally de separate, uh, into uh, one under all under one roof, so to speak, under one umbrella of the OMB under Donna Donna Edwin's uh, 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 tenure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, I think that's a I think that's a great step on the administration's part. There was there's been a lot of gnashing of teeth in the blogs and elsewhere 
uh, about the the manner in which it was done that the that the uh, uh, administrative order wasn't you know posted immediately and that sort of stuff but the substance uh, of the administrative order i think is is hugely uh, important and and very positive basically what we've had is a situation where all of the uh, uh, various branches or, or agencies of government uh, run by the commissioners um, have been separate in the in the sense that they develop their own budget and, and roll the budget up to the central administration or to the governor and then the governor sort of picks and chooses. But you still have this entrenched bureaucracy back in the in the departments that are try that are you know rep as they think they're supposed to do, representing the department and trying to get the most money they can um, and running their numbers in a way that supports their department's position of trying to get the uh, the highest dollars uh, for that department they can. The the effect of this is to take all of those sort of separate uh, 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 lobbying centers, if you will, for money out of the departments and move them all under the governor's office and set up a situation where the governor says, look, we've got $3.75 billion to spend. We're going to allocate it among the departments this way. Um, and and sort of rolling that number down to the departments in a way where the departments get that number, receive that number, and then deal with that number, uh, as opposed to the departments trying to you know lobby uh, for the for the most dollars their department can get, uh, and essentially saying, look, I know I know John needs to be cut. I know that department over there needs to be cut, but I, my department needs all this money. And look, here's all the support for that. So I think I think the consolidation of the budget offices under OMB. Uh, makes a huge amount of sense uh, and will help uh, this administration uh, uh, get spending under control, at least in terms of, of, of as far as the governor can control it before it gets to the legislature and after it comes out of the legislature. Well, and part of this uh, comes off as, I mean, first of all, this wasn't published by the administration themselves, and you could see how this is going to rankle a lot of the rank-and-file bureaucracy because – uh, and because of that reason alone, that you could see that it wasn't released by the administration. It was instead leaked by a employee uh, who was probably a little bent out of shape that their ability to feather their nest or bolster their little fiefdom or do whatever uh, has now been hindered by this new move, making it easier for the government to cut into budgets and cut into the government as a whole, which I think a lot of these people – are not really, you know, regardless of the fact whether they resigned and asked to be rehired or not, they're really not on board with, obviously. No, you've got, I mean, it, it, it's understandable. Um, it, it, the, the department and the department budget officers are out for their department, right? Uh, you, you, you would hope, you know that they're part of government, you know that they're part of the whole, and you know at some level they, they, they're supportive of the government as a whole. But their job, their their nine to five job is to go in there every day and 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 advocate and lobby for their department and do things that that support their department and they'll base it and and if you ask them about well you know you're increasing cost of government or you're not reducing cost of government their their response to that will be that's somebody else's job my job is to advocate for and push uh the mission of the of this department and that's i mean that's sort of an understandable thing this sort of builds up in the bureaucracy and and keeps you know keeps building uh, over time as long as you have that function inside the department. So I think moving that out of the department and getting it into central government, uh, and then just sort of the the departments will be the takers of of what the of what the governor decides their allocated share of revenues is. Um, I think that's a very I think that's a very positive. It breaks that mindset, uh, breaks that 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 bureaucratic. Uh, structure that sort of reinforces that mindset, and and reinforces that no, it's the it's the it's the governor's office that runs these things, makes these decisions, uh, not the individual departments. Well, and this is what you and I have talked about that that's the only way that anything is really going to get done this go around is the is the governor governor is going to have to break all norms and kind of uh, uh, you know do some do stuff different than what we've seen in the past. And that's, uh, this is a good start for now. We'll continue this discussion with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. 
The top, uh, the the number three of the top three is uh, kind of one that is uh, more amorphous. Uh, one of the reasons why that we talk about on this program the danger of just kicking the can down the road and putting things off, you know, staving off the inevitable uh, that's going to happen. You know, you can only do something for so long before it eventually comes back to bite you. Uh, deals with these fiscal issues, and that it's not just us, it's our children and our children's children. And there's an article here from the Wash Po uh, that was carried through the ADN that, that talks a little bit about this. Let's talk about number three. Well, so the, the title of the article is uh, Millennials Aren't Breaking Traditions, They're Just Broke. Uh, and basically, the, the, the writer uh, Catherine Rampell, who's a, 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 an op-ed writer, a conservative op-ed writer for the Washington Post, um, is picking up on a recent uh, study by one of the uh, Federal Reserve Banks about uh, that, that looks at millennials and tries to um, uh, analyze whether how, how millennials are different from the baby boomers and their spending habits and in uh, and in a variety of other things and whether um, uh, the, the millennials are spending differently, and that's why some of the old uh, approaches, department stores, and other things are sort of uh, are sort of breaking down and becoming becoming different. If it if it's the millennial uh, the millennial effect, and basically the uh, the the thrust of the Federal Reserve Bank study picked up on uh, by uh, Catherine's uh, uh, commentary here is is that the millennials aren't really that different in their in their desires uh, from the baby boomers. Yeah, they would like to have uh, new cars and they would like to go on cruises and they'd like to go to casinos and they'd, you know, they'd like to buy from department stores, but they just don't have the same amount of money. Um, and so their, sp their spending habits and their, their, um, uh, uh, the, the things they're buying and, and the effect they're having on the economy is not so much driven by different desires than the baby boomer generation. It's, it's driven by the fact their economic situation is different uh, from the baby boomers. And both the study and, and Rampell's op-ed focus on the effect of the Great Recession in 2008 uh, on, the, on the millennials and, and, and how that has really set back their career, set back their earning power, uh, and really affected them in a way that uh, is different than the baby boomers uh, have been have been affected and and really undermined their economic their economic condition. That that point that the millennials are in a different economic situation to me uh, it plays an important role in why I spend a lot of time being concerned about fiscal policies that just kick the can down the road. I mean, you'll, we'll, let's go back to H, HB 331 for a moment, which is the bill, was the bill to bond uh, a bunch of the oil, oil tax credits that, uh, that the state owes that otherwise were going to be paid out in the, in the fairly near term right. uh, by the current generation, but, but through the bond uh, is being kicked largely to the, to the 2020s and the 2030s. Uh, the gener into a, into a time period that the millennials are going to have to be dealing with that, as opposed to the baby boomers. It sort of takes the baby boomers, sort of takes that cost the baby boomers were otherwise going to have to confront, and kicks it down the road to the millennials. Well, that's that's unfair and it's bad policy for a number of reasons. Uh, but one of the reasons it's bad policy is the is the millennials are not in are in worse economic condition coming into coming into their uh, generation than the baby boomers have been in our gener it, it, than the baby boomers are uh, in the current generation, and it's really it's unfair on to to and we're doing this all over the place. I mean, we've done it with PERS and TERS um, by by you know funding the last seven years of deficits through the draws from the constitutional budget reserve and essentially forcing the next generation to refill the constitutional budget reserve to pay for our excess spending. We're doing it in a number of, of, of ways, and we're shifting it off to a generation that is less well prepared, less economically well prepared to deal with, not, not of their own doing, but because of what's happened in, in our economic condition in general, less well prepared to deal with these issues than, than the baby boomers are. So it's, it's, it's bad fiscal policy from a number of standpoints. Um, uh, but it's horrible fiscal policy from the standpoint of, of intergenerational equity. This generation, which is much better situated to be able to deal with these costs, 
uh, is kicking it down to a generation uh, that's much less well prepared uh, to deal with these costs. And I think that's just I, I think that's just a, an abominable uh, 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 step that that this generation continues to take, both at the federal level and at the state level. Can I can I break you out of your shell for just a second? We're talking with Brad Keithley from Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets, and just talk about the expectations for just a second. Because one of the things that struck me in this article and in other articles I've read about millennials and the and the economic hardships that they're facing is that um, you know the the American dream, the previous American dream of home ownership and all these these are very recent, really innovations that you know it used to be that that you wouldn't, uh, you know, own a home until you were into your uh, older years. It used to be that there were multi-generational families, and we're seeing a lot of that going back now where they're living in a multi-generational home and some of these other things. And some of these things are just the realities of the economy as a whole, uh, of course, exacerbated by the actions of Congress and, and state legislatures and everything else. But isn't there just a fundamental dichotomy shift here as well? Well, yeah. Uh, the baby boomers have enjoyed uh, a huge economic boom uh, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, 90s, and on into the 2000s, um, and have been huge beneficiaries of, of that sort of economic growth. 2008 uh, reshuffled, reshuffled the deck to some degree, and it reshuffled it right in the middle of the of the launch period for the baby boomers in terms of in terms of their college education, uh, law school, graduate schools, uh, and and really has put them on a much different uh, a much different path uh, that sends them back to I mean, you're right I mean sends them back to an economic situation that is that is more like uh, 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 the pre baby boomer period than 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 the baby boomer period. Um, I mean, I, I I can I can deal with it. I can I can feel for this. I I was on the board of the alumni board of of my law school uh, during the 2008, 2009, 2010 period, and we had I mean we have we have a law school that had placed 90 plus percent of our graduates, 95 plus uh, percent of our graduates historically, and and sort of are doing that again. But during the 2008, 9, 10, 11 period. We were placing, you know, 60% of our graduates, um, not because the law school had suffered some loss of, of reputation. Uh, we were still ranked very high in terms of reputation. It was because those right. jobs just weren't out there. Right. Uh, right. And and so you have a gener you have these kids who who got shuffled off to different career paths, uh, much less much less economically advantageous career paths. Uh, and and that's who we're now trying to shift all of these government costs. Right. Uh, final thoughts here. I'll let you wrap up since we ran. Uh, I shouldn't have asked that question, but I, I just it's it's been <laughs> it's been bugging me for the longest time. I mean, in all honesty, because I you know I think that that a lot of times what we end up with is this um, is this entitlement mentality, and and I don't mean that in a bad way, but you know that hey, this is what my parents had, and this is so this is what I want, and this is what everybody needs to have is the the house and the car the 2.5 kids and and we should have all those things that our parents had and because we're the next generation we should have it sooner and better and realizing that these things are cyclic and they change and uh, i really think that we're going back to a pre-world war ii kind of ideal because we have spent so much because we have done so many things wrong financially in this country and the new accepted norm is going to be um, you know, I mean, these kids really haven't had the understanding of historical hardships as far as depressions and some of these other things. They're going to have to go back to the identifying as a multiple, you know, um, multiple uh, 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 people living in the same home, et cetera. Yeah, it's it's I, I, I don't know exactly where we're going. I do know that we're dumping what's now approaching 22 trillion dollars of national debt. Uh, on to our kids and grandkids. I do know that we are we are on the verge of exploding into annual trillion dollar uh, uh, budget deficits at, at a national level. It's going to be piled on our kids and grandkids. I do know that in Alaska, uh, we've drawn down something like twenty billion dollars over the last seven years out of out of various fiscal kitties uh, in order to sustain our spending levels. And that and that we've drained the fiscal kitties, and now the next generation is going to have to refill them back up to prepare for 
uh, the next down cycle in, uh, in in state government revenues, and we've dumped that obligation on them. And 331 dumps yet another obligation on them. PERS and TERS dumps yet another obligation on them. So I, it's not – I mean, some of it is is – their expectations may be a little bit unrealistic, but a lot of it to me is this generation just running up the credit card for its own benefit, um, and, and, but it's a credit card that's in our kid's name uh, as opposed to being in our name. Her Harold, they're, they're Harold says it, we're also dumping trillion dollars worth of assets on the kids as well, but, I mean, you got depreciating assets and everything else, and the problem is the spending is outweighing the assets by – a, a factor of, you know, a multiple factor. <laughs> well, we're dumping deteriorating assets on them. I mean, you look at the roads and the highways around the nation, we're talking about a huge infrastructure bill. I mean, you just look around the University of Alaska, the Alaska system, all the buildings they've got, they're in a deteriorating de deteriorating condition because we, we haven't maintained them. Yeah, we're giving them a bunch of assets, but they're a bunch of assets that guess what? They're going to have to pay to repair uh, uh, and, and and keep going. So it's, it's not a – this generation has been extremely selfish uh, in terms of we want it all and we want it all now, uh, and we want it – but we don't want to pay for it. Right. Uh, and, and I just I, – we've been very unfair to the next generation. There are other reasons why this fiscal policy, be, policy is bad. You want those, those people who are here when the spending is occurring, when government spending is occurring, to pay for it. Because that's the only way they're going to curb spending, right? If they get to shove spending off on somebody else, they're not going to have any incentive to curb spending. So you want a current, you want the generation that's spending to pay for the spending uh, in order to create an incentive to, to curb the spending. That's a that's another reason you want the current generation to to pay for things. But a big part of this, to me, is just is is the the problems we're creating for our kids and grandkids through the fiscal policy that we've been running the last uh, last last few decades. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Uh, thank you, my friend, for coming in and joining us. One more. One more week, uh, and then we'll have uh, some sleeps through Christmas and New Year's, where you'll take some time off. I'll take some. Uh, we'll we'll be off on those holidays, so uh, uh, we'll talk with you next week. Hopefully, we'll have a budget by then and can kind of dissect that as well. We will, and I look forward to it, Michael. Thanks for having. Me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.